my name is Adam Jacoff. I'm from the National Institute of Standards and Technology. I'm Tom Haas, uh, retired from the City of Los Angeles Smart Department. We support and work on international robotic competitions uh, through various outlets. We had the FEMA Urban Search and Rescue teams coming together with the National Institute of Standards and Technology start developing testing standards for response robotics for disaster. All the competitions do is provide a launching pad for them to work out their systems, moving them closer to a commercial prototype, something that's purchasable by responders. From the responder side, this uh, is some of the stuff that we would like to see robots be successful in because these are some of the disaster type environments. That's what we're trying to simulate. And so having the mobility for the platform to get over the terrain in a timely fashion. So when we've been doing these competitions for more than 20 years, started in like 1999. Um, some of the early standard test methods, the terrains, difficult as they were, changed the face of mobility, changed the approach to mobility. All these tests highlight the intelligence of the system in some way or another. Sometimes it's just about the gait and walking. Legged robots have to be smart right out of the box or they couldn't walk. You could not control them all the degrees of freedom from a remote. You wouldn't have any idea how to control each leg joint. So they have to be smart. So the tests measure that because we put them through a statistically significant number of trials so that they can see what gates are working. These tests are reproducible anywhere. These were built in Korea, shipped to Japan. They're going to the Atomic Energy Agency of Japan to work with their legged robots and improve their tech and maybe train their operators and ultimately credential before going into Fukushima. So the notion of a standard test method is really about an apparatus that can be well described and replicated anywhere rather cheaply that we can insert increasing levels of difficulty so that it tunes to just beyond your capability where you think you're comfortable as a robot. In this case, these were all flat yesterday in our preliminaries. Now they're all elevated to 15 degrees. This crossover is the kind of thing that robots need to accurately cross over at the apex here and then deal with the roll motion that comes with it, slipping, sliding, so in this case, this is called the K-Rails. They are an increasingly high tripping obstacle. When we're doing a big robot-like spot, they're two or three high. This is more the scale of the competition robots, so they're only at 10 centimeters, but it's adjustable. It doesn't mean that your world looks like this. It means that this is reproducible complexity. Other complementary tests, this one specifically for legged systems, has the notion of adjustable trip hazards in this case, making this transition complicated. But the key to the foam is that it's an easy way for us to ensure that the robot's paws go below the perceived ground plane, like mud or sand. It works surprisingly well to confuse legged systems that are all automatically adjusting and sometimes this introduces noise into their signal. You know, it took a fall. Oh. <laughs> well, it's always satisfying, start to finish, because you see how much people are working for a long time toward this end, and then it's working out or it's not working out, but there's something magic that happens in these competitions. It really brings people together in a way to sort of just get a measurement of where we are as a technology or as a series of capabilities. Next, we're bringing in um, more partial image recognition for their autonomy. We're gonna bring in more tasks like interaction with the environment. We need to get them moving toward dexterity and interaction with the environment, which is a step harder.